June, we focused on intimacy, right? We had a great time last Sunday. I know the summer gets a little bit lighter, but at the same time, last Sunday, we had a great time just talking about intimacy and about the value that it plays in this church. But today, we're going to take advantage of the 4th of July to transition from intimacy into identity. And as we've talked about over and over again, you don't know... So intimacy, identity, influence, right? You don't know your influence, what you were made to do, unless you know who you are, your identity, and you don't know who you are, your identity, unless you know your intimacy, who you belong to. So we spent all last month talking about the principles and the ideas of intimacy. This month, we're going to talk about identity. And as we're celebrating Independence Day, I really felt like the Lord wanted to take this opportunity to use our nation as an example for us personally and for us spiritually as a church and the things that he's taken this church, the the United States through. So two years ago, I shared a message called The Order, The Spirit of a Nation, and it was part of a series that I did on um, on the order of the spiritual realm. And even we talked about first heaven, second heaven, third heaven. We talked about principalities and powers. We talked about all kinds of stuff around that. And then I talked about the spirit that was in the United States and gave a whole lot of information. And I don't want to repeat, I'm not going to repeat hardly anything from that message today, but if you want the information, because I just shared the history and actual written record of the formation of this country and how it came out of revival. And so if you want to hear that message, go back and find it. It's in the playlist called The Order, and it's on our YouTube page. Today, we're going to focus on one aspect, really, of that. But in the spirit of a nation, I shared the actual documented history of the formation of our government from beliefs and convictions that were sweeping the land. There was an incredible movement of Jesus that we refer to as the Great Awakening. And if you guys have studied the Great Awakening, or if you remember that message two years ago, We talked about how in 1726, the Great Awakening came to the United States. And it actually was started in Europe, but it it was like just a little flame there. When it came to the United States, it was like, whoosh. Well, we weren't the United States yet. We were the British colonies. But the entire landscape was transformed by radical, radical experience with God that hit the shores of America. And we call that the Great Awakening. This incredible Christian revival of 1726 defined what would take place in 1776. It was this spiritual awakening that conceived our Declaration of Independence, our Constitution, the branches of our government, and the anti-slavery movement that runs through every founding document and was shared by nearly every one of our founding fathers. The Great Awakening of 1726 set drew the people of the British colonies here in America to the Lord in such a profound way that it formed a nation in 1776. Okay? So a previously unseen and unimagined identity formed from a people who experienced intimacy with God in a profound way. How many years between 1726 and 1776? 50. And what does 50 years represent in the Bible? Jubilee. All right, we're all on the same page. Jubilee. If you guys remember, in the Bible, Jubilee. Every 50 years, the slaves would be freed, the debts would be canceled, and land would be restored. Right? That was part of the very basic principles of the Israel of nation that God was putting in them. He was putting deep inside of them, in their culture, already programming for redemption and liberation. Redemption and freedom. He was saying, you guys, this is going to be a core part of who you are. Every 50 years, you're going to set the slaves free and everybody's debt is canceled. Man, that is so unworldly. Can you imagine? Having all of your debt canceled suddenly? How many of you guys would party like crazy that last year? (laughs) Don't. None of us would. None of us would. (laughs) This was one of the many kingdom principles that separated Israel from every other nation. It carried an innate value for redemption and freedom. 
I believe the Lord moved in a miraculous supernatural revival here in what would become the United States. And what he was doing was very much what he was doing in Israel, but a different level and a different time. And it was a prophetic picture of what he was going to be doing here among the nations. He was calling a people to himself and re-identifying them. And I think he's doing the same thing here among us in Wellspring and in many other churches around the world. Right now, he is doing something very similar to what we saw happen, where this ragtag bunch of people were experiencing an incredible new level of intimacy that just increased and increased and increased until the whole landscape was on fire and completely transformed. And that's when he said, okay, now, I can, now you can be the people I've created you to be, my jubilee people. He's reawakening a passion for redemption and freedom. In Wellspring, as the Lord draws us into intimacy, he's also restoring our identity as his redemptive agents, as his freedom fighters. Why do we talk about freedom so much? Because part of our identity is that God has created us to be a jubilee people. We don't wait over 50 years now. Jesus Christ accomplished everything at the cross so that we can be a jubilee people. This is why he's called us to such a heavy focus on freedom ministry. We as the church represent jubilee on the earth. Each one of us in here represents jubilee. Isn't that awesome? So the story of America is a prophetic parable to us and to the world. God did something very different in a special time, in a special place. This nation was intentionally raised up and formed as a display of God's heart for redemption and freedom. And that's what we're celebrating today. We would not be here. We would not have our culture. We wouldn't be called the land of the free without the revival of 1726. It was the ideas that God was forming. It was the mind of Christ that he was putting in people of all colors, all backgrounds, all genders. He was doing, well, not all genders. There's only two. Men and women alike. He was doing amazing things among the people who had come here for various reasons to form a people. Prior to 1726, people came to America for many different reasons, but it was never for reasons of comfort. The comfortable did not make it across the sea. <laughs> the comfortable did not come to a land where you had to be an adventurous pioneer to survive. Who were the people that came here? It was the people that were bold. It was the people that were bold. People came here because they were enslaved by debt. They had a name that had been dishonored. They belonged to a caste system. They were slaves to they were enslaved by servitude, by poverty, by religious persecution. They were people who had no hope of prosperity where they were. So they were willing to give everything up to come here and live in this dangerous, challenging land where nothing is promised you except the chance to work and make something happen. And God took this incredible group of desperate adventurers and started a fire. He was working revival in Europe already, but it didn't catch fire till it caught this desperate group of adventurers that had moved here for various reasons, but all because they were enslaved by something. They came here to be free. They came because they had no opportunity to prosper where they were. And it was in this hodgepodge of adventurous and desperate people that the Holy Spirit exploded onto the scene, drawing all men and women, race and color, to himself and conceiving a nation out of revival. The United States of America was birthed out of the Great Awakening, one of the greatest revivals, but not the greatest. That's still just beginning. Psalm 33:12. Blessed and prosperous is that nation who has God as their Lord. They will be the people he has chosen for his own. The people that were gathering here, as they experienced the fire of God being lit up among them, they suddenly had a very real experience of this scripture. Galatians 3.28 
There's no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Galatians 3.28 was the rising sentiment among the people as revival swept the land. God was leveling the playing field. He was removing prejudice. He was, he was bringing people together that were never together before. Unity, equality, freedom, these were all ideas that were being birthed through the redemptive power of Jesus Christ in this country. They didn't bring it with them, but they found it when they came here. This is Dr. Walter E. Williams. He says, an estimated three-quarters of all people alive were trapped in bondage against their will, either in some form of slavery or serfdom. At the time that God started doing amazing things here, three-quarters, 75% of all people in the world were enslaved. So what God was doing here was different than anything else going on in the world. The perception of slavery as morally unacceptable didn't become widespread until the middle of the 18th century in America and was still very prevalent in much of the rest of the world. Among those who turned against slavery in the 18th century were George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Patrick Henry, and other American leaders. You could research all of the 18th century Africa or Asia or the Middle East without finding any comparable rejection of slavery there. This wasn't happening anywhere in the world. But it started happening here in a revival. It was the heart of God. He was doing something amazing. And he was igniting a passion. This was a very isolated formation of ideas that was coming out of this spiritual revival first sparked in Europe, but only erupting into full flame in the American colonies. The common sentiment of the Great Awakening was best worded by George Whitfield, who was one of the founders of Methodism and the Evangelical Movement. He was one of the biggest speakers in the, in the first Great Awakening. Oh, stupendous love. While we were his enemies, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, that he might become a curse for us. Oh, the freeness, as well as the infinity of the love of God our Father. It is uns unsearchable. I am lost in contemplating it. It is past finding out. This was the sentiment. This was the idea. This was the feeling that was just running all across the colonies. Again, this is... This is before the United States became the United States. But God was forming something. He was forming a movement. He was moving in a powerful way. And it wasn't just great preaching. Whitfield was an amazing preacher. And a lot, they were at a lot of other great preachers. It wasn't just great preaching, though. People were experiencing the presence of God. And not only were they experiencing the presence of God, they were experiencing the power of God in ways that they'd never seen before. The miraculous was happening. Whitfield, one of the founders of Methodism and the evangelical movement, was the most noted preacher of the First Great Awakening, the spiritual revival that swept the English colonies from 1726 to around 1770. The message of Whitfield and the Great Awakening transformed the culture of colonial America. It changed everything. It changed everything. You couldn't go anywhere without seeing the changes it was making in people. And sometimes we talk about what should revival look like, Go back and study what happened in this revival. That's what should, revival should look like. But at our time, it should look like more. I know we're happy when we feel like a supernatural tingling in the atmosphere. It's revival. No. Revival completely changed the landscape of the British colonies. Profanity, immorality, and drunkenness almost completely disappeared in some areas. And entire towns and villages were transformed. New England alone saw 30 to 40,000 new converts and 150 new churches. People lived to do good, and missionary and humanitarian enterprises were spawned. Colleges such as Princeton and Columbia were established because they needed more pastors because so many people were getting saved. Did you guys know that our Ivy League colleges started as seminaries because of the Great Awakening? They needed more pastors. You'd never know if you visited them today but they were all out of revival. All of the land was coming to Jesus, being restored to right relationship with Father God and being immersed in the Holy Spirit in real, real, tangible ways. And this was forming a new national identity among the people. The people who were experiencing revival together were beginning to form an identity together through and from that revival. Jonathan Edwards, one of the preachers during that time, said, 
Our public assemblies were then beautiful. The congregation was alive in God's service. Everyone intent on the public worship. They loved to worship. From time to time in tears while the, Lord, while the word was preached, some weeping with sorrow and distress, others with joy and love, others with pity and concern for the souls of their neighbors. Can you imagine going to church every Sunday and everybody's super excited to worship and they're all crying? For various reasons, some are crying for joy, some are crying because they're, they're convicted, some are crying because they feel so much in love for their neighbors that they want them to be saved. That was what was going on before the formation of this country. Even Benjamin Franklin, if you guys studied Benjamin Franklin, this dude was one of our number one, he wasn't only a founding father, but he was one of our founding fathers of sarcasm and cynicism. <laughs> But he visited Philadelphia in 1739, 37 years before the Declaration of Independence. And while he was there, the, the Great Awakening was in full swing. And this is what he wrote. It was wonderful to see. Again, this is Benjamin Franklin, cynic, sarcastic cynic. Yet he wrote, it was wonderful, wonderful to see the change soon made in the manners of our inhabitants. All the people in the land were changing for the positive. From being thoughtless or indifferent about religion, whenever they talk about religion, they're talking about Christianity. That word to them equated to Christianity because there was no other religion in the land. From being thoughtless or indifferent about religion, it seemed as if all the world were growing religious so that one could not walk through the town in an evening with hearing psalms sung in different families of every street. The streets were filled with worship songs. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine walking through your neighborhood and you can't go anywhere? Walking through downtown Dallas and you can't go down a single street without hearing people worshiping God? This was really happening. I mean, if it wasn't, Benjamin Franklin would be the first to tell you. <laughs> he'd, say, he'd probably say something like, the people are mad, the people are mad. But he didn't because he saw real change. He saw incredible change in the manners of the people around him. They actually started caring for each other. They were singing worship songs in the streets. There was something dramatic happening. This was the Great Awakening. People were literally singing worship songs on every street in Philadelphia. We used to live in Pennsylvania. You didn't go to Philadelphia unless you really had to. But in this place, revival had hit in such a way that every inhabitant was impacted. Bars were shutting down. People were, were leaving work to go to church. People were traveling extra long just to hear a, a message and be impacted by the word of God. Biblical ideas. Oh, this is, this is interesting. So people, women... Native Americans and those of African descent all participated in the Great Awakening. Everyone was involved. Barriers came down as Whitfield's own journal shared stories of men, women, black and white, all coming together, casting racism and prejudice to the side to embrace the spirit of Christ. He has records of this in his journal. Whitfield famous, famously said that he believed that God would highly favor the black community and show the world that the Lord was no respecter of men. This is radical stuff that was coming out of the Great Awakening in the United States. And this radical stuff that no one else was contemplating in the rest of the world, it all came out of the presence of God and was beginning to form an identity. It came from intimacy to begin forming and percolating and bubbling up to form an identity of a people. Biblical ideas of creation and equality became common thought and the foundation of this nation. And because of this national revival, these Protestant Christian views were developing political, economic, and social ideas that existed nowhere else in the world. The idea of America as the home of the free was not just words, guys. It was not just words. It was not just a political mantra. It was truth. It was experienced. And... Originally, it was not referring to freedom to debase ourselves in sin as our culture adamantly pushes for today. Today, when we talk about the land of the free, we think it means we're free to sin all we want. But that was not the mentality that was going on here. It wasn't the spirit. It was based in moral outrage against tyrannical rule, against religious persecution, and against the devaluing of human life. 
It was the preaching of the revived church that formed the language and culture of a rising nation. Just prior to the 17, just prior to 1726, many of the church leaders at that time were actually talking about how uh, hopeless the American church scene looked. They were actually, before 1726, before revival broke out, they were talking about how dry the American church was, how unalive it was. It was dead and apathetic. That was the conversation. Then, boom, fire hit, and it went boom and changed everything. Suddenly, the Holy Spirit sparked a forest fire, drawing men and women of all walks of life into deep intimacy with himself. Phyllis Wheatley, this is America's first published black poet, and she was greatly moved by um, Whitfield, the preacher. And she actually wrote this, uh, when he died, she wrote this in his honor. Thou didst in strains of eloquence refined, inflame the heart and captivate the mind. The greatest gift that even God can give, he freely offered to the numerous throng. Take him, ye Africans, he longs for you, impartial savior is his title due. This is Phyllis Wheatley. Phyllis Wheatley was sold into slavery at the age of seven by an African chief. And she was bought by the Wheatleys, and she was adopted into the family like a daughter. And she was raised up and encouraged to be a poet, and she became an amazing poet. She actually became friends with George Washington. George Washington loved her writing. As people were drawing near to God, he began to humanize slaves and make people aware of the evil inherent in the institution of slavery. This began to develop a shared value of freedom, and black and white were drawn together in resisting the tyranny of the British government and resisting its inherent culture of slavery. This was said of Crispus. Have you guys ever heard of Crispus? Yeah? Patriot, protest leader. Leader and voice that day, the first to defy and the first to die. He was black. One of our first American martyrs in the United States was a black man. He was, a free, he was an escaped slave who became a free man. He was an escaped slave who moved to Boston and then rose to leadership in the protest movement against the English government. And he was one of those that was killed in 1770 by the British government in what was called <clears throat> the Boston Massacre. Black and white stood shoulder to shoulder that day, and this was a direct result of the Great Awakening. Did you guys know that also one-seventh of the Revolutionary Army under George Washington was black. One-seventh was freed slaves. One in seven. In 1776, when this nation first separated from England, several states took steps to abolish slavery, something they could never do under King George. This was all systems that were brought in through England, something they could never do under King George. The southern states resisted, because of monetary motives. But the sentiments released by, released by the Great Awakening were already beginning to bloom into a growing abolitionist movement. And this was the question that everyone was asking among themselves in their communities and in their meetings and all over this land. If we are all creatures of the same creator and if Christ died that all might be saved, then how can slavery ever be justified? This was the common conversation before 1776, beginning at 1726, because Christ motivated the conversation through the great revival that was happening. And even today, we are having conversations, but there is no fix except through Jesus Christ, who set things in motion the first time and will get us back on track again. After being radically impacted by Jesus, people were having conversations and they were implementing Christ-minded ideas that had never formed any other nation in existence. Even today, when we arrogantly try to take what we believe in America and push it on another nation, it inevitably fails nearly every time because they weren't formed out of revival. And we forget to bring the revival, we just bring the principles. And they don't work outside of revival. The American parable was a story of intimacy with God forming a radical new identity, and this identity carried a name, freedom. In order to experience this freedom, they would have to cut their tie with an old bloodline. We talk about that, right, a lot in our freedom ministry? Cutting off the old bloodline. In freedom ministry, you talk about cutting off old bloodlines and being grafted into Christ, right? 
This was something that they, <laughs> they were discovering in a very tangible, real way. The free America needed to cut the old bloodline and receive a new identity. The Great Awakening prepared them for the cut. That's what God was doing when he brought these people together that had come to this nation for various reasons, but he lit them on fire with his holy presence. They were experiencing him. They were experiencing his mind. They were experiencing the power of his love. Radical things were happening, right? And in all of that, it was a preparation for the cut because he wanted to cut them off from where they came from and graft them into a new thing. But though conviction was palpable in the air, not all were willing to complete the sever, especially the southern states. And I'm a southerner. <laughs> I was an army brat, but I grew up being told that uh, the Civil War had nothing to do with slavery because that's what southerners tell each other. Uh, but, but it did. And, you know, we, have to, we all have to be uneducated in some things and be willing to learn other things. But we have to do it through the right we, we really have to do it through the heart of God and really seek the heart of God and what was he doing in his people, the people he called to himself. What was he giving in the revelation? Because otherwise we really do get caught up in one person's formation of history and then another person's formation of history. And we miss the facts and the truth. And so much of what's being taught now and even rewritten is completely missing the fact that there was a great awakening that initiated all the good things. And even some of the convictions that did not get completely lived out. So unfortunately, the southern states longed for freedom from English tyranny, but we were not determined to keep that same tyrannical cult. We, were, we desired freedom from England, but we wanted to keep the same tyrannical behavior amongst ourselves in slavery. They wanted new freedom, but old prosperity and power. And that's still what a lot of us still run into. We want freedom, but we want to still want to have the power that the old ways would give us. This double-mindedness in applying the transformative power of Christ is what eventually led to the Civil War. Ultimately, the great divide of our nation was how far we would follow the jubilee principles of Christ. How far would we be willing to go? John Allen, one of the preachers during that time, said, Bless ye, pretended votaries of freedom, ye trifling patriots, who are making a vain parade of being advocates for the liberties of mankind, who are thus making a mockery of your profession by trampling on the sacred natural rights and privileges of Africans. So once these conversations started happening, then the real battles also started happening. How much are we willing to sacrifice for the things that God is putting on our hearts? How radical are we going to get for this amazing things that God is doing among us. And lines started being drawn. And even people like John Allen and a lot of other people started pointing out, you guys are being a bunch of hypocrites. You're talking about liberty, and yet you own slaves. And it was something that was really being battled, even among our forefathers. When the first Continental Congress met in 1774, so that's two years before the Declaration of Independence, they mainly met to discuss what they're going to do about all the occupying British military and what was going on in the land. But do you know what they ended up doing while they were together? They made a radical resolution. Our national forefathers passed a resolu resolution stating that the slave trade should be abolished and that nations engaged in it should be boycotted. This is what our forefathers did when they came together. What do we do about this British? Oh, I don't know what to do about this British. Look at all this military. What do we do? I don't know. Let's end slavery. <laughs> If anybody tells you this wasn't happening, uh, to call them a liar, please. This is what was happening. All 13 states, except Georgia, agreed to this. All of the states, except Georgia, had banned or suspended the importation of slaves within the next 13-year period. Unfortunately, later, what happened when the states got back together after the war and everything had kind of settled down a little bit, then the South said, okay, that was great. We need to undo this because they really depended on the system that they already had in place. And so then it was pushed, instead of all of us are doing it together, then it became a state decision. And again, this is one of those things that eventually led to the Civil War. In not taking a united and firm stance against the sin of slavery, their inaction brought destruction and violence upon later generations. Their refusal to fully embody their calling as the Jubilee Nation 
left them unsevered from their previous bloodline. The United States was supposed to be the Jubilee Nation, but they only went partial. It's kind of like the story of Israel over and over again, right? They're supposed to be the promised people, but they, they took some steps, and they'd say, okay, we'll go this far, and we'll give this much up and not this. We're going to keep do this, but we're going to keep this. And the American, American nation, this Jubilee Nation, found itself in the same situation. The Civil War was just a continuation of the incomplete Revolutionary War. And the violent division we're presently experiencing in our nation derives from the remnants that still flow from a tyrannical bloodline. Things that were not cut off in 1776 are leading to the things that we're experiencing today. In the years preceding the Revolutionary War, there was a rising cry from the pulpits and from the people of all the colonies. There was a rising cry to end slavery so that we could... As a nation and as a one people, we could fully embrace the identity the Lord given us as the land of the free, the Jubilee Nation. The Great Awakening was birthing a new people group, though imperfect, based in biblical, spirit-led concepts never before implemented. And that alone blessed us as a nation for the next almost, we're not quite at 250 years, are we? Almost. <laughs> yeah, we need our math geniuses up here. So by the time of the writing of the Declaration of Independence in 1776 and the Constitution in 1787, nearly every founding father, including those who still owned slaves, took a public stand against slavery because of the driving convictions of the Great Awakening. The Great Awakening had had such, had had such an effect that it was part of every conversation. Freedom was a part of every conversation. Let's look at some of our, just a few of our founding fathers. Benjamin Rush was one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence, and he was the first Surgeon General in this nation. He helped form America's first abolition society. He also partnered with Richard Allen, a black preacher, to found the first black church in America, Bethel Methodist Church, which would eventually become the African Methodist Episcopal denomination, one of the largest and most respected black denominations in America. This is what Benjamin Rush said. Slavery is a hydra sin and includes in it every violation of the precepts of the laws and the gospels. Let's look at another one. James Madison, the fourth president, he called slavery the most oppressive dominion ever exercised by man over man. Governor Morris gave a blazing anti-slavery speech at the Constitutional Convention in which he called slavery a nefarious practice that stood in defiance of the most sacred laws of humanity. John Adams, vice president under Washington and then the second president, never owned slaves and famously said, every measure of prudence ought to be assumed for the eventual total extirpation of slavery from the United States. I have throughout my whole life held the practice of slavery in abhorrence. Benjamin Franklin, he freed his slaves in 1785, so it took him a little bit to get this. But... He also joined the Pennsylvania Society for, promote, per, for promoting the abolition of slavery. Once he got it, he really got it. Later, he became the society's president. He called slavery an, an atrocious debasement of human nature and a source of serious evils. Alexander Hamilton, chief of staff for General Washington and the first secretary of the treasury, founded the New York Society for promoting the manumission of slavery. He emphasized that slaveholders should take the initiative of freeing their slaves, not because the law of the land demanded, but simply because it was the right thing to do. He, deferred to, he referred to slaves as our brethren, whom should equally share in civil and religious liberties. In 1787, his society that he, that he started opened the African Free School in, in New York City to educate black children and prepare them for success in the new nation. Hamilton said about himself that he never owned a slave, his family, the following generations, also said they never owned slaves. But right now, there's a real movement to, you guys know, there's a big movement right now to rewrite history. And even though there's no facts behind it, if you say something enough and you tell the right people and you teach it in a classroom, it makes it fact. We should all know that because we've seen the same thing happen with evolution. Evolution is called a theory. And yet, it's so touched every aspect of our lives that we live like it's a law, right? 
And they're doing the same thing, some people, with American history now. And so they're actually saying that, he, that Hamilton owned slaves, even though there's no proof in history. Anyways, carrying on. George Washington, the first and only president to be elected into office twice with 100% of electoral votes, was born into a Virginia slave-holding family. But, he wrote in 1786, there is not a man living who wishes more sincerely than I do to see a plan adopted for the abolition of slavery. Washington, as I already mentioned, befriended Phyllis Wheatley. He loved her poetry. And he greatly, he greatly admired her. But also, as I already mentioned, he, he, one-seventh of his armies was free black men. He had a great respect because he fought alongside. Before he died, he managed to transition his estate at Mount Vernon to slave-free. He offered freedom to all of his slaves. But if they wanted to stay, he offered them a salary. Not only that, but he built a school for all of his slave families so that they could be prepared when they did leave. They would be educated in order to really embrace the opportunities that they would have. That was George Washington. Patrick Henry, he's one of the interesting ones. They're all interesting. They all had to battle new ideas. They all had to feel these convictions, which they really felt, and decide what they wanted to do with it, right? We have no idea the pressure that was on them. We have some things going on in the world that we should start making some serious decisions about, what we're going to believe and what we're going to do. But at that time, because of the revival that took place, it was everywhere. The pressure of the conviction of the Holy Spirit to change thinking. So Patrick Henry, can anybody tell me what he famously said? Yes, give me liberty or give me death, but don't free my slaves. It was unfortunate. <laughs> Patrick Henry was an example of those, one of our forefathers who lived in contradiction. He actually did get up. So he said statements like that, and he got up many times and talked about the horrors of slavery. But when it came down to it, he still owned slaves. He spoke passionately, passionately against slavery, believed it was sinful and wrong, and yet continued owning slaves. He was like the rich young ruler in the Bible who said he'd do whatever he needed to do to be righteous. Remember that guy? The rich young ruler in the Bible went up to Jesus, and he thought he had it all together. What else must I do? And Jesus said, okay, sell everything and follow me. And what did he do? He turned around and walked away, probably distraught and destroyed for the rest of his life. We don't know the rest of the story. When Jesus said, sell everything and follow me, the young man walked away unable to release his life of convenience. Patrick Henry said this. This is a quote from Patrick Henry in responding to one of his friends who was continually saying, why are you still owning slaves? This is what you said. Why are you doing this? He was constantly, he was constantly uh, holding his feet to the fire. This is what's coming out of your mouth. This is your lifestyle. Are you going to do what you're saying? And this is, his, this is Patrick Henry's response. Would anyone believe... I am the master of slaves of my own purchase. I'm drawn along by the general inconvenience of living here without them. I will not. I cannot justify it. He refused to repent. He had all the conviction, but no fruit of repentance in his life. Pay attention. Pay attention to this. Pay attention to this. Patrick Henry willfully made a bad lifestyle choice that he could not defend or justify. He knew and was strongly convicted by the evil of slavery, yet, in a way, he was a slave to convenience and refused to make the hard changes. His conflicted story is the epitome of men and women who call themselves Christians because they feel the conviction but are unwilling to cut off the old bloodline completely. He was double-minded. Like so many others of his time and ours today, the double-minded want the benefit of Jesus, but not the inconvenience. The true gospel is an inconvenient gospel, guys. And if, as we're experiencing true revival among us, as this thing increases, because we're we're, this is going to increase among us, and all of us are going to have to face some hard decisions because the true gospel is inconvenient. People in uh, Patrick Henry's boat want to experience jubilee in their own lives but are unwilling to be inconvenienced by extending it to others. Unfortunately, they don't understand that giving is the key to receiving, right? 
Isn't that a biblical principle? So like Patrick Henry, many convicted souls remain captives of convenience. And I think this is, this is a word from the Lord. Because this is what we see a lot in, the Ameri- in America. We see slaves of convenience. And I heard somebody say, I, I think it's somebody who was quoting Patrick Henry and then adding a little something else. Give me freedom or give me death in this modern time of ours has become, give me, give me comfort at any price. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And then we have Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> to bring it back, Thomas Jefferson called slavery a moral depravity and hideous blot and said that it presented the greatest threat to the future survival of America. Do you think he was prophetic? He saw something, didn't he? He said, guys, this thing right here is going to destroy us if we don't handle it right. I don't know, they didn't listen to him. Jefferson was very aware of the line of sin and iniquity that needed to be severed in order for this people to rise to their higher identity and calling. In an early draft of the Declaration of Independence, he actually wrote, he, <laughs> this was taken out of the Declaration of Independence, but in one of his early drafts, he accused the King of England of waging war against human against human nature itself, because he blamed the king of England as the one who initially brought the slavery into the United States and that culture. So he put all the blame on the king. They took that out of the final draft. I, I don't know why. Because I think, I think Thomas Jefferson actually got a very spiritual and true principle. The bloodline has to be cut. And the king of England was the bloodline. The government of England was a bloodline. And it carried a tyrannical thing that if it wasn't completely cut, would continue in a different way here in the United States. It would continue different because of all the good that had come out of the revival, but it would still be there in some seed form. Which even today, if we talk about the sin of convenience, we see it in an intense way in abortion. Abortion is the sin of convenience. So this is what did make it in. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. There are so many important words in this. The most important in the beginning is right here. This all came out of the awakening. This all came out of revival. The very thinking that formed this nation is summed up right here. This is what came out in 1726, percolated over 50 years, and launched a nation, a jubilee nation, in 1776. A common shared view of creator God formed the foundation of this nation. And that shared view was birthed out of church revivals. The identity of a nation was being formed from intimacy with God. In radical relationship with Jesus, his mind, the mind of Christ, and his thinking began to permeate permeate and saturate all the people. Everyone was being transformed in a radical way. Their thinking was being changed. Their lifestyles were being changed. People were becoming friends that before would have barriers of color and gender. This thinking changed their paradigm and transformed their worldview. The people of this nation had experienced relationship with a very real Lord God. Therefore, they could not deny that there was a creator. And this made its way in, in the documents and the thinking and everything that was being formed. There was a basic foundation that there is a creator who has made us. We are all created by the creator. This creator values his creation and gives each one certain rights, three of those being life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Every human being has a right to live, to be free from tyranny, and to eat the fruits of their labor. That's what this stuff meant. This was and continues to be radical stuff. Self-evident truths, founding principles of a national identity. First of all, there is a creator. This is where we came from as a nation. An agreement that there is a creator. Number two, the creator makes all humans equally valuable. In the eyes of God, there's not one person in this room or that we know that is less valuable than I am or more valuable than I am. We are all greatly beloved by the one who made us. Number three, the creator incorporates in each and every human certain inherent rights, including the right to live, 
to be free from oppression and subjugation and to prosper. I know some people get really irritated by what they call the prosperity gospel, but the Amer America was based on a prosperity gospel, guys. It's in the Declaration of Independence. We were made to prosper, and we should all have the freedom to pursue that. We should all be free to work hard and eat the fruit of our labor. That's what all of this meant. Every principle was founded in biblical ideas instilled during the Great Awakening. So whenever you think about and whenever you celebrate today, July 4th, whenever you celebrate 1776, the signing of the Declaration of Independence, whenever you celebrate this, remember the 50 years that made it happen. 1726. Every July 4th, celebrate the Great Awakening that enabled the Declaration of Independence. Celebrate the intimacy of God that formed the identity of God that we get to celebrate. All of it came out of a revival movement beyond anything we've seen in our lifetime together. Fifty years. Jubilee Nation. Oh, what was just a group of colonies like so many other colonies around the world. There were colonies all over the world. But what happened here was different. And it was a revival that made that difference. You know, the American colonies weren't any better than any other colony in the, in the world. It's just supernatural and the incredible favor and grace of God that when the preachers who were preaching the same thing in Europe came to the land, there was a hunger to receive it. There was a hunger for the freedom that it lit up in, within the people. And we had a radical experience with the Lord that became and formed a jubilee nation. It became a prophetic picture of what the Lord wanted to do around the world. It wasn't perfect, but it was sincere enough that for all the following generations, this country we live in would be called the land of the free. It made enough of a difference and an impact because of the revival that it came out of. And now I think the Lord is bringing us into another great awakening. I believe with all my heart that we are stepping into another great awakening. We are beginning. It's just beginning. This is just the beginning. This is when the voices are just starting to be heard, when the message is just starting to be heard, that God is just turning the faucet. But more is about to come. That little drip that we're experiencing just now is about to become a rushing river as we embrace it with the radical, the radical embracing of our early forefathers. I believe God is raising up a jubilee generation a group of people with unwavering zeal for intimacy with the Creator and an inextinguishable passion for His ministry of freedom. And that's what He's forming right here among us. A group of people who is passionate for the freedom that Jesus Christ provided and the ministry that He's called us into. We are the Jubilee people. Early on, our nation embodied so much of God's heart for redemption and liberty, but to this day we feel the impact of its incomplete surrender to Christ that formed a dark underbelly of hypocrisy. We're still aching from the trauma of our civil war. We need some a lot of ministry just around that. And we're still squirming under the weight of our convenient choices and our many sins of convenience. Our forefathers chose to cut off England, but not its tyrannical and entitled spirit. And that's still very present today. As the Jubilee generation, we really have to resolve that we're going to completely do what we've been learning to do. We're going to completely need to cut off the old bloodlines. We're going to have to completely reject the old identities and be willing to come into the fullness that we've been called into, that Jesus Christ died for, that Jesus Christ said, I completely provide for you. Jesus said, I have all authority on heaven and earth. And then he's delegated us to walk out and be the Jubilee Nation. Jesus Christ, when he opened up the scroll of Isaiah and he read it, he said, this is fulfilled in front of you. What does that mean? He was announcing the age of the grace of God. The Jubilee has come. That's what he was announcing. And it's us as the church who are supposed to fully embrace this. As the Jubilee generation, we must be resolved to completely cut ourselves off from the old bloodline in order to be grafted into the blood of Jesus. Our identity and cause will be corrupted by incomplete surrender. There will only be civil war in churches who refuse to be inconvenienced by complete surrender to Jesus. Convictions are meaningless without the fruit of repentance. From surrendered intimacy, God is calling out the Jubilee generation to rise up and go. Are you guys part of this generation? 
That's what we each have to decide just among ourselves. Am I part of this generation that God is calling up? God put this word, you know, he gave me that revelation. I'd never looked at the years and put it all together that there was a jubilee nation until the middle of this past week. But once he gave me this word, then I started seeing the word jubilee pop up all over the place. God is really, really doing something here among us in this time. Luke 4, 18 and 19. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. We are in the Jubilee. If we'll embrace it and walk in it as a free people, as a freeing people, as freedom fighters, spiritually and naturally, the prophet Isaiah wrote these words. Jesus Christ spoke these words. We fully embody these words. And I want to encourage us, don't be Patrick Henry's. Do not go halfway. Don't embrace the speech, but not the actions. We have to go 100% and fully embrace an inconvenient gospel. This is the inconvenient gospel. Receive the Spirit of the Lord. He is anointing you to bring the news of salvation and transformation through the name of Jesus. Where people have lacked, they may now prosper. You are being sent to declare that the captives must be released. We're sent to declare this. The captives must be released. Eyes are now open to receive revelation. We declare this. The oppressed must be set free. We will settle for nothing less. This is is the time of God's favor and grace. All of this is what we proclaim. And we walk 24-7, every aspect, every there is no secularization. Every compartment is no longer a compartment. We are 100% walking into every aspect of our lives, declaring the captives must be released. Eyes are now open to receive revelation. The oppressed must be set free. This is the time of God's favor and grace. That might mean that we have to actually speak up even to those that are confined by religious spirits. Even to those that are only preaching gloom and doom. No. This is the time of the Lord's favor. This is the identity the Lord is calling you and I into. Are we willing to fully embrace the identity of Jubilee and live in it? Partake of it and pass it on. Share it. There's no halfway or partial surrender involved. There's no selective sacrifice, a little bit over here, but not over here. If we live that way, we're leaving the hard choices for future generations. We're just declaring to the future generations, the ones coming behind us, sorry, folks, y'all are going to have civil war and suffer violence because I won't stand up 100%. The good news of the kingdom is inconvenient, and it is also complete. Will we fully embrace the blood of Jesus and cut ourselves off from the old kingdom? Will we defend the right to life? Remember, it says life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. Will we defend life? Will we rise up and fully embody redemption and freedom? Will we stand for the righteous principles that prosper a people in a land, that historically have prospered a people in a land. But there's so much more that God wants to do. But it means that we have to get back to the place that birthed us, back into the presence of God. No social program, no plan, no politician, no political party, no military force will be able to bring us to the place that God has called us. The only thing that's going to bring us is going back to the place we began. The place we began was intimacy with God. When a nation goes down or a society perishes, one condition may always be found. They forgot where they came from. They lost sight of what had brought them along. And I know that's happening very intentionally in our country. And we have to resist it and remember where we came from. We came out of intimacy with God. That's what made this nation so special. 
But I also believe, like I already said, God is calling us. Not just as a nation, but as a people. He's moving. He's moving beyond our national borders in the Jubilee movement. And it's going to be an international people of Jubilee rising up and representing what we already saw, what Jesus professed, the scripture from Isaiah. Awesome. I, I want to pray for us uh, according to what we talked about. There were three things that we mentioned when we said the Jubilee. And we said um, complete forgiveness of debt. Freedom and uh, restoration of inheritance. That's what Jubilee really happened on Jubilee. So when we call ourselves the Jubilee generation, I want to pray that over every one of us also, okay? Lord, thank you so much. Thank you that you've given us this word for this Sunday. Thank you, Lord, that you have declared over us that we are the Jubilee generation right here. No matter the age, we are a people of Jubilee. And in saying that, you are declaring, and I am professing your declaration today, these three things, that every person in this room, all of their debt would be erased, completely forgiven, in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. I speak prosperity and blessing over every person financially in this place, in the name of Jesus. Lord, not by might, not by power, but by your spirit, I declare, in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. That is part of the shift. The second part of the shift, I declare freedom over every person in here. Anyone who has been enslaved by thought patterns, they felt enslaved by, by the things that they've grown up in their family, by their own behavior, by addiction, I declare freedom in the name of Jesus Christ. By situations that there's no other way out of, I declare freedom in the name of Jesus. Again, not by power, not by might, but by your spirit. I declare in the name of Jesus Christ. And number three, I declare uh, that there will be a restoration of inheritance among us. Every person here, the things that were stolen by the enemy, the things that were stolen by conniving, even the things that were lost to bad decisions, we declare in the name of Jesus Christ restoration of, the th of, the, of their inheritance. Thank you, Lord. Restoration of inheritance. Thank you, Lord. The things that you've stored up over generations, we can't even knock it out by our own stupid choices because we declare today that there is forgiveness, there is freedom, and there is restoration in the name of Jesus Christ. And I thank you, Lord, for the testimonies, the things you've done before, you're doing again in even a mightier way, in a, in a greater way, in more and greater abundance. In Jesus' name, we love you, God. Thank you that you have identified us as the Jubilee generation. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And we do fully embrace the excitement of stepping into this new time, this new people you're calling us to be. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Mm -hmm.